So, um, Valunkia Buddha or Purna, um, he's one of the disciples of the Buddha and he likes to ask many questions about um, the world, the nature, future and humans, etc. He wants to ask questions like, is this world, is it permanent, eternal or one day it will, it will be destroyed? Is there a border to this world? Is there a limit or is it finite? When he asked these questions, the Buddha uh, did not ask him, answer him. So one day um, he got quite annoyed. So he, he said, the Buddha, if you do not um, answer these questions for me, I will stop being a monastic. So the Buddha called Purna over and he said the day that you become a monastic did I promise you that I will answer these questions for you? Do I answer questions that uh, is this word finite or unlimited? Is it eternal or forever or one day will be destroyed? No, Buddha, uh, you did not promise me you would answer that. So why did you ask me that if I don't answer you these questions, I will disrobe? So then the Buddha told him about the story of a person who uh, was stuck with a poisoned arrow So people uh, invite a medicine man, a doctor, to come and treat him. And that person say, "Oh, please don't! Uh, you don't don't treat me yet. I want you to tell me yet uh, who's the person who shot the arrow. What's that person's name? And why did that person shoot an arrow at me? Did uh, they have some kind of problem with me? If I know all mm -hmm. of that, then uh, doctor, you can treat me." And the doctor said, uh, if you're going to spend the time to, for me to answer all those questions, then you probably already die from the poison. So in us, we have all this pain and suffering, and we just sit there and just ask all these questions. Then we will never be healed from these poisons. So that's why the Buddha is teaching things that are beneficial for us to transform and heal ourselves. So the teaching of the Buddha is very practical. The Buddha taught us about afflictions and how to transform the affliction. Even though he can answer these questions, but it is not beneficial for a practitioner, these questions. And more than that, some questions he cannot answer it's not that he doesn't know how to answer it, but to answer it whether it's a yes or no question, then he cannot answer it. One time when the Buddha was doing walking meditation in the forest and he came home, and, and that was in Kosambi. So he, he came home and he held the 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 leaves of the Simsampa tree and he asked the monastics um, the the leaves in my hand is that a lot or is, or is it um, few uh, compared to the forest so the monastic said oh the leaves in your hands are only a few compared to the the leaves of the forest so the Buddha said what I know is a lot like the forest, but what I bring out to teach you is only a little bit. Why? It's because these things are important and they can help you to transform and heal. But all the other things, they, are, they do not have the effects to help you to transform and heal. So the story shows that Buddhism is, has a very practical purpose for us to transform and heal. 
But there are many people, um, even the kings and the disciples of the students, uh, the Buddha, they often like to ask these questions, these 14 questions that are called Voki, or these questions that B the Buddha never want to answer. The first question is, is this word Thung, which means eternal? Is this word eternal or is it not eternal? It means one day this word will it end or does it just continue continue on forever eternally and there's no end to it. Or is this word both eternal and non-eternal? <clears throat> or is this word either um, non-eternal? Or is it not non-eternal? Non-non-eternal. So these are four questions about the word. So people want to answer the Buddha to answer according to these four questions. Like there are four check boxes. And the Buddha refused to check any of the boxes. Because because all four of the questions, they're all wrong. You cannot do just one check mark like this, then that would be wrong. These four uh, clauses, they're, they're called the Dugu, the four clauses. And the wisdom of the Buddha is beyond these four classes. So it's called Li Tu Gu, beyond the four classes. And is this word um, limited or finite? Is it limited or unlimited? Is it a border? Is there a limit to this word? So vo hang means unlimited. Or the seventh question is, is, is this word both limited and unlimited? And the eighth question is, is it neither unlimited or not not limited? So it's neither unlimited or not not limited. And people also uh, put more four more check boxes for the Buddha to answer, but the Buddha refused to answer. So these are the four. Um, these are the questions that are not answered. Voki, there is called um, <coughs> avi, Aviyakarta. Voki, it's uh, called non-declared answer, the non-answer. non-declaring so those are the first eight questions that um, Puna really wanted the Buddha to answer 
and the later questions uh, even ask more to the Buddha. Is the Tathagata after he passed away? After he entered Nirvana? Does the Tathagata still exist? Or he, there's nothing left of him? Same with the Buddha or us. After death, is there anything of us left? So that's another question. Or Or is it after death? Uh, or is it after death we still exist? Or the eleventh question is we are both still exist and not exist. And the twelfth question is is it is it the Tagata still is neither not exist or not not exist. So these are the twelve questions that they um, the the people forced the Buddha to answer. And there are two more questions. The thirteen questions is is our soul and our body So the 13 questions is, are our souls and body one? And the 14 questions is, are our souls and body are two different things? So these questions are not answered. So that's why they're called Voki or Aviya Karta. In Belgium, there is a Buddhist scholar his name is Louis de Valet uh, Poussin. He studied Buddhism a lot and he knew Sanskrit, Pali, and Chinese. And he's taught at the Institute of Catholic in Paris. At the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. He studied a lot. He was able to translate it in 1952. Um, he translated the Abhidhamma Kostra Sutra by uh, Vasubandhu. And he was able to translate the Tanji Thuk Lung Chen Wei Chi Lung by Hui Jian. Master Huyeng Jiang, so he must be very well studied uh, in order to translate these works. But with these questions, he had he had the um, questions that oh the Buddha did not answer these questions. Now that he passed away, then we cannot do anything about it. So the 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 leaves in his hand, these are the hands. So he should answer it but once he pass away then who else can read all these leaves in his hands so he said that there are things that the buddha still kept himself and did not tell others and he said that there is a conflict between the teaching of the buddha and his philosophy Because he put uh, three, put forth three issues, that the mechanism, the 
the mechanism of the karma retribution. and samsara. The mechanism of karma retribution and samsara. So this mechanism the Buddha has talked about clearly. He said that if there is no ob uh, object or there's no subject, then who's the person? There's no self. So who's the person who caused the karma and who's the person who received the karma? In the word um, uh, karma retributions and um, samsara in Brahma tradition is very easy to understand because in their tradition they have uh, ideas of an atma of a sense of self an atta and that is something called a uh, jiva uh, which we translate it into the force of uh, the vital force or the soul it's called jiva Jiva, or the, the soul, and this is the body. So the soul and the body, is it one or two? The body and mind, psychosoma, is that one or two? So those are the two questions. So to, to this Buddhist scholar, his... Um, the issue for him is that the Buddha's teaching on the mechanism of karma retribution and samsara is not very clear because he said that there is no sense of self in the teaching. So if there's no self, then if there's no self, then how can you define the, the law of the karma retributions? Who's the person who who commits the karma, who receives the karma, and who's the one to get rebirth? So that was his first question from the scholar. And these are the things he wrote in his last book, Le Buddhisme, Le Dogma, and Philosophy of Buddhism. So these are the dogma and philosophies of Buddhism. And that's after he has translated the, um, the Abhidhamma Kosha Sutra and the Chen Wei Si Lung Sutra from Huyen Zhang. And the second issue is, is the quality, the quality of the soul. quality of the soul of man because everyone has a, a soul the quality the nature of the the soul that goes into rebirth what is it the the jiva the quality of the jiva or the vital force and he said that the Buddha did not say clearly about this issue. And the third um, topic is about Nirvana. He thought that the Buddha did not uh, said this very clearly. That is the B Nirvana is it a REM, a REM. This REM where is it located? 
and can we be in touch with it and go there? What's the route to get there? What is the nature of Nirvana? And he thought that the Buddha did not teach that clearly. So first, questions is about the mechanism of the karma retributions and samsara. And second issue was with the definitions of the vital force or the soul. So if you say there is samsara, so who's the person who's going into rebirth? And is what is the nature of that uh, subject of that uh, soul? And the third issue is that he said the Buddha did not ta teach very clearly about nirvana. And but with me, I feel that the Buddha had taught about this very clearly. But we have to see that the other questions of the Buddhist scholars. So we can help um, explain to people later on who uh, research Buddhism. In the sutra, uh, I was mentioned about two, two things, about non-self. So there, two, non-self. So the person is non-self, and the dharma is non-self. Nhân vô ngã and pháp vô ngã. Nhân, it means human. Pugala Mara Mira. Pugala means human and and the other part is uh, non-self. So if we look deeply in us, we say that we don't have a separate self, that we are not an entity that is permanent, that everlasting, that's never changing. And that we will not continue forever. So that is a self. That is something that is everlasting, permanent, permanent, and does not change. So that's the definition of self. Something that's permanent and not changing. And that is easy to understand. If we just look at the human, we have five elements. The body, feelings, uh, for perceptions mental formations and consciousness and all these are changing in every second there is nothing that's not changing from our body to our feelings to our perceptions to our mental formations to our consciousness all these five rivers they continually flow and none of these rivers there's nothing that is everlasting or not changing at all. So that means there's no self. So there is no self that is outside of these five rivers. There's nothing that is everlasting or not changing. So that's what it means by nhân vô ngã. The human is not, uh, is, is non-self. And the same with the Dharma. The Dharma is non-self such as this marker or the whiteboard or the bell or the mountain on that river so there is nothing that is not changing that is everlasting so that's why not just in human but in the dharma or the phenomenon 
is also non-self. So it's the Dhamma Mairatya. So this is the foundation because impermanence is a beginning point because of perma impermanence everything is changing all dharma are of the nature of changing has this quality of changing in every satna every minute seconds and impermanence Many people heard about impermanence and have this impressions that uh, it's a negative thing and thinking that impermanence is something that's negative. But the truth is if there's no impermanence, then there's no life. It's because of impermanence, that's why we have life. For example, we have a button and we press the button and the whole world will stop, will pause, everything will freeze. And at that time, there will be no life. Isn't that true? There's some noise in the back. It's almost like we are uh, showing a movie on the screen and we press the button for it to pause then everyone on the screen will freeze everything will stand still so there's no life the reason there is life because there is impermanence if there's no impermanence then the corn seeds will always be a corn seeds for eons there will be nothing else just the corn seed that is the truth if, ev if everything is not impermanence then the baby is always a baby if everything is not impermanence then then we would just get sick um, and we just get sick all the time and we would never heal or this dictatorships will continue forever and there's no democracy so impermanence is something that's quite good but why is it that we talk about it sounds negative that's something that is not um, that's not strong like if there is no impermanence then then it's it's a uh, to say that impermanence is negative then that's not correct there is some noise there's some kind of noise in the back can you please check we have learned uh, last week that in the sutra there are many places where they repeat the the phrase where the Buddha talked to his students and he said that the body is impermanent or is it permanent and feelings perceptions mental formations are they permanent or impermanent then the student answer is impermanent and the Buddha asked if it's impermanent so is it suffering or is it joy then uh, per the student answer impermanence is suffering that is not what the Buddha mean that is the wrong um, the wrong transcribing down of the Buddha's teaching the Buddha had some very smart student but also some students not very smart if you say that the impermanence leads to suffering then that's not the meaning of the Buddha if there's no impermanence then you will never awaken you will be the fullest one forever you need to have impermanence for your trash to be transformed into flower 
So if there's no impermanence, then there's no change for us to transform and to, um, to have peace and happiness. So in the sutra, they have these sections like this because they're haunted by the ideas of suffering. So they're changing uh, the sutra into the, these ideas. And if they say that if it's, if it's impermanence, then is there a sense of self in it? Of course, if there's impermanence, then there's no self because self is something that's permanent and everlasting. So that's why non-self and impermanent are one. If, it's, if there's impermanence, then there's non-self. So this jiva or the soul is not something that's an everlasting or permanent self. So if you say the soul and the body, is it one or two, then that's wrong. If you say if the soul and the body is one, it's wrong. Or if you say they are different, then they are wrong. Because there's no such thing. There's nothing that's everlasting. No such thing. So in these uh, questions and answer with from the monk Nati and the King Milanda, there is this question. The King Milanda asked the same question to this monk. Dear Thai, is the body, uh, are the body and the soul, they're one or two? So this monk refused to answer according to the Buddha's uh, spirit. He refused to answer. But the, the, but the king said, you had agreed with me that I ask whatever questions you will answer me. So why don't you answer me? So the monk said, dear king, in your in your garden, uh, is your mango sour or sweet? And the king could not answer him. The king said, I cannot answer because in my garden I don't grow mango. So I cannot say if it's sweet or sour. So the, the monk Nadia said, that's the same. There is no eternal soul or body that you can say is it one or, or two. It's different from the body. So that's the story. There is nothing everlasting, nothing permanent. There's no self. So if you say that is the self uh, is one or two, is the self different from the, the non-self? That's wrong too. So if you don't grow mango, then you can't say that your mango tree produce sweet or sour fruit. It's the same with When people ask, so this is the time, and this is the year 2000, and 2013, and there's a man who caused some karma um, in the year 2000, and you said he's the author of this act, of this karma. He's the actor. He's the author, the person who caused it, the person who caused this karma. And in 2013, so is that, uh, is, there's a karma retribution, the result of that karma. So the person who received that karma, or ta ye, the receiving, the receiver, or recipient. So the person who caused the karma and the person who received the karma. So people ask the Buddha, is the person who caused the karma and the person who received it, are they one or two different people? So that is the same with these two check boxes that they ask the Buddha to check. Is the person who caused the karma and the person who received the karma is it one or two? But the usual idea is that um, it's one person. The person who grow the corn uh, seeds will harvest the corn, or the person who caused the storm, who, who, who caused the wind, they would harvest the storm. So those are in the these approximations 
um, of these ideas, then they said the person who causes it is the one who receives it, the karma, the retributions. So that is an approximation of the truth. But in terms of the absolute truth, then everything is continuously changing and impermanent. From 2000 to 2013, um, it's more than these 12 years. So this guy, he's only changed so much in his body, his uh, feelings, mental formations, and perceptions. And so these two, these two men in these years, they are very different. If you say these two men are the same, then you fall into the wrong idea of the, the eternal, eternal self, the, the permanent self. But if you say these two men are two different people, then it's not correct either. If you say if you say that, then you fall into the the annihilation camp. One is eternalism, and the other side is annihilations. And if you ask the Buddha to just check one of these boxes, then he refused. He said that I let go of these two polar opposites so I stand in the middle way so this is a middle path that we go beyond these two polar opposites so whether it is or it is not these two polar opposites so is it one or is it the same so nhất it means in in one. So, so if it's uh, two or different, then it's called otherness. So it's neither neither one or two. Phi nhất phi nhị. So this is the middle way. So these fourteen questions we cannot answer. Because why? Because these 14 questions, they have this meaning of these things, these, the word, and the Tagata, the tagata and, our, and our soul, these are the permanent things. If the word is um, is continually changing or impermanent then whether you say it's uh, eternal or not eternal or both eternal or not eternal or not eternal or not not eternal N none of these are uh, correct and if you say if the word doesn't have any sense of separate self that there is nothing permanent then you say if the word is limited or n unlimited or both limited or not limited or neither limited non-limited or non non-limited so none of these will be correct either because we get stuck in the idea of there is a phenomenon of the word that is permanent so if you see that there's a sense of non-self then you can understand that these questions that put forth are already wrong based the same with those questions of the king that they ask is this body and this uh, soul are they one or two and they force the monk to answer is it one or is it two different things he can't answer so he said I cannot answer you because what you call the eternal soul there's no such thing there is nothing that is impermanent or everlasting because there is no self so you cannot say it's one or two separate things so the same idea with the person who caused the karma and the person receiving the karma if you say it's one or sameness then you fall into the camp of, um, of eternalism but if you say it's two separate things then you fall into the camp of annihilation so you cannot say because in the middle way you can see that all these check boxes they are within um, the realm of the mental categories they do not carry the truth such as these categories of birth, death 
existing or not existing to be or not be object or subject those are in the realms of the mental categories so if you use these mental categories to to carry to to go toward the truth then they're all wrong so these 14 questions are then the question that you do not answer because if you try to answer then you're wrong you're wrong in the middle path because the middle path goes beyond these two ideas of the wrong perception that there is permanence that there is a sense of self that there is being and there's non-being and there is coming and there's going there's birth and death and that there is the same and there is difference so when we read the sutra Kachayana Kachinyin then we know that the Buddha said right view is something that goes beyond what is something uh, the realm of uh, being and non-being so it's the same with the going beyond the realm of birth and death and in the Anulada, Anulada Sutra uh, the monk Anulada he was walking outside and he saw some um, monastics from other traditions they stopped him and asked him you are the students of Gotama is that true come here and let me ask you a few questions after that the Tagata pass away he still exists or he does not exist or he doesn't exist and or he's both existing and not existing or he not existing and not not existing so he he refused to answer he said that my teacher the Buddha he never <coughs> taught uh, us in those four mental can, uh, mental categories of these four classes he said that you do not answer these four questions and the other the other monks he thought that oh he must be a new monk so he does not know anything so let him go so the An Anuradha left so when he came back and he asked the Buddha he retold the story and said this morning I was walking and some of the monks from other tradition asked me about these things and this is how I handle it and can you please teach me uh, how to answer it so the next time I'm stopped and ask questions then, then I can answer it better so the Buddha taught very clearly dear Anuradha Anuradha, please look at me. Do you think that this body is me? Is the Tathagata this body? Is this form this body, this Tathagata? So the Anuradha answer no. So does it mean uh, the Tathagata exists outside of this body? No. The, the Tathagata is neither this body or outside this body. So the feelings, can you find the Tathagata in the feelings? No. Outside the feelings? No. So from the body to the, for, to the feelings to the mental formations, perceptions and consciousness so I'm here and you cannot find me anywhere so if you can you find a Tathagata that is permanent and everlasting even while he's still alive so when if this body is not there anymore then you can't find it either why I'm alive you cannot find him so why do you think that you can find the Tathagata after he passed away so it's very clear that to find an everlasting permanent Tathagata you will never find it we often find that if we can touch if we can grab on this permanent Buddha then we have it but no we don't we cannot grasp the Tathagata because we don't know who we are 
ourselves. So the Tathagata or any other phenomenon, they are of the they are of the nature of cannot be grasped. Because when we grasp or capture, then we grasp by our mental concepts within these mental categories such as being and non-being, birth and death, coming and going. Such as we we use a basket and we put in the river and trying to catch the water. And can you catch the water? Or if you use your hands to 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 capture the air, can you with your five fingers capture the air or capture the wind? It's the same. These mental categories of birth and death, being and non-being, one or one or many difference, none of these cannot be captured. The truth cannot be captured by these ideas of self or permanence. You can never capture the truth. So these 14 questions cannot be answered. It's not because we cannot and it's not because we don't have the capacity to answer them, but whenever we answer them, we will be wrong because they're, the questions are still within these mental categories of being and non-being, of existing and not existing. So dear Sangha, now is the time for um, walking meditations. We'll pause here.